All right, so I'm gonna cover health disparities in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I'll start by just giving a thank you to the various uh, places in the university where I sit, including the McLean Center, um, also the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Ethics, obviously the University of Chicago Medicine and the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translation Research. Um, so I'm just gonna give a brief snapshot for COVID disparities, which is always in flux, um, but mainly wanna talk about why the disparities exist and what are some of the things that we can do to address them. When the pandemic first came out, um, Chicago was one of the first cities that were naming the disparities that we saw by race. Um, so despite having 30% of the population being African-American, 70% of the deaths, 72% of the deaths were amongst African-Americans. Within two months, we had decreased that death rate, um, that proportion of deaths, of COVID deaths, to, down to 42%. Um, in South Carolina, 30% of the population was African-American, 51% of the deaths uh, were uh, amongst African-Americans. Um, and so we see this consistent disproportionate um, rate of deaths by COVID despite uh, the lower proportion of the population. Um, in California, the Latinx population was 39%, 61% of COVID deaths. Mm -hmm. Another way that we also are can be thinking about this is not just by race and ethnicity, but also by class. And so in California, where they have census tracts that are looking at low HPI levels, um, which is sort of a measure of uh, well being based on socioeconomics, 24% of the population of, uh, live in census tracts with a low HPI, yet 61% of the case positivity rates for COVID are in those same census tracts. This map is, uh, is an older map, uh, despite how, with the fact that we've only been in the pandemic for a relatively short period of time. On the left, we'll see uh, uh, states that have disparities in COVID infection rates. And on the right, uh, we see states that have disparities in COVID deaths. Um, and so we see that there's a lot of heter heterogeneity even within the United States. The states that are in gray are ones that have not been reporting um, data by race and ethnicity. And so uh, what we do know is that there's a lot of variation by race, by class, by geography. Um, and so there are a number of reasons that are, that are driving some of these uh, disparities that we're seeing in our country. And so what I wanna talk about is why some of these disparities exist and what are the, again, some of the things that we can do to address them. My uh, hypothesis, um, which is borne out by evidence, is that structural racism is a significant driver. Um, perhaps the, I won't say the only, but the, the most significant driver of COVID-19 uh, disparities that we're seeing in the United States. So in, in multiple different ways. So structural racism causes biological changes. So there's a lot of uh, debate about um, whether or not there are biological differences in race versus race being a social construct. And so I don't want people to misunderstand uh, me in that race is a social construct, but racism is causing biological changes in people who are subject, so who are subject to racism. Um, and so that is impacting our health. And so for, as, uh, for, for one example, structural racism increases uh, people's uh, likelihood to form chronic diseases such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic lung disease. Um, and some of the mechanisms through that are um, through increased allostatic load, um, through um, changes in our pathophysiology such that we have alterations in our autonomic nervous system, alterations to our um, hypopituitary thalamic axis, alterations in our inflammatory system, in our endocrinology system. And so that those long-term effects of uh, prolonged release of cortisol, for example, increases our risk for diabetes and all of these other uh, chronic medical conditions. We also see changes in our acute inflammatory responses. Um, and so people who have been specifically studying that um, have been looking, for example, at our antiviral responses and have attributed 50% of the black-white difference in the genetic immune response um, to racial discrimination. 
And so again, what has started out as a social construct has because of racism had biological, has had biological and pathophysiological changes amongst those who are subjected to racism. And so we have seen that there are structural, there, that there are associations between structural inequities and health outcomes. And so if we look at things like residential segregation, community violence, food insecurity, limitations to the built environment, specifically racial discrimination, poor housing, these are all um, conditions, these kinds of structural inequities um, that have been associated with obesity, diabetes, hypertension, um, chronic lung disease, cardiovascular disease, and asthma. Um, and that is not a complete listing of uh, kinds of structural inequities uh, or uh, the health conditions, but they're ones which are uh, related as we think about risk factors for poor COVID outcomes. Um, and so that is uh, relevant to our conversation today as we think about some of the mechanisms by which structural racism may contribute to um, poor COVID outcomes. And so these, I'm just gonna show you as a sort of a, a walkthrough um, as uh, some journal titles that will allow us to just begin thinking about, because um, we don't have time for a deep dive, uh, some of the patho pathophysiological mechanisms. So this was entitled Accelerated Telomere Shortening in Response to Life Stress. So telomeres being sort of the, the capped ends of our chromosomes that help protect us against chronic disease. Um, when those shorten, then we are less protected against chronic diseases. And so telomere shortening has been associated with uh, life stressors, um, things like chronic poverty um, and other stressful situations in which uh, marginalized for, uh, people have been forced to live in. Um, chronic exposure to everyday discrimination and coronary, coronary artery calcification in African-American women, the Swan Heart Study. So everyday discrimination um, has been looked at as a key um, mechanism um, on the causal pathway in between um, the life stressors of chronic discrimination and the outcomes that we see for health. So how we, how, how persons of color um, are impacted by everyday discrimination and internalize that um, and uh, how that may then in, in turn um, impact our, our health. Um, another one is uh, self-reported ex uh, experiences of everyday discrimination are associated with elevated C-reactive protein levels, which we all know is sort of a chronic inflammatory marker. Um, and we think about that as being uh, related to cardiovascular disease in older African-American adults. Um, epigenetic signals of how social uh, disadvantage gets under the skin, a challenge to the public health community. And then this last one, the fire this time, and that's a reference to James Baldwin's um, uh, work, the fire next time, um, the stress of racism, inflammation, and COVID-19. And that specifically references uh, the viral responses that I was referring to um, uh, earlier in one of the slides. So in addition to thinking about um, how our pathophysiology might be altered as a result of structural racism, then there's then what we more typically think about as far as limitations in individual opportunities um, and things like racialized residential segregation. So I'm gonna talk a lot about Chicago because that's where I've been living for the past 20 years and that's uh, just the, the case study that we'll use for today. So Chicago is a city that is wonderful, which is why I've continued to live here, but it's a city that is extremely racially segregated um, by not only race, but also by class. And so if we take a look at this map, we'll see that um, any community that has more than 90% clustering by race or ethnicity um, has a specific color. Um, and it's only those cities, I mean, I'm sorry, only those communities that are in white are ones that have less than 90% uh, of uh, racial and ethnic group uh, that is mixed. And so Hyde Park is like the little bubble that's uh, number 41 surrounded by green. Uh, so the green areas are communities that are more than 90% African-American, which you'll see most prominently on the south and west sides, which is a, a, a 
residential sort of layover from the great migrations. Um, the orange areas are greater than 90% uh, Latinx. The purple areas, primarily on the north side of Chicago, um, are primarily uh, white neighborhoods. And then again, the, the areas in white are ones that don't have a predominant racial group that's more than 90%. Doesn't mean that it's uh, necessarily uh, segregated, uh, but it's not more so than 90%. And then we have one uh, little area of Chinatown uh, that is a non-Hispanic Asian, that's blue. So if we look at uh, our COVID mortality rates by zip code, you'll see that the darkest blue, the highest rates um, are still in areas of our city that are um, in predominantly African-American and Hispanic uh, or Latinx communities, even though we have made significant strides in reducing uh, these disparities within our city. Okay, I'm just gonna... There we go. So we have to think not only about all of the individual uh, pathophysiology things that I was thinking about when we th think about chronic diseases and things like that, but also think about geography and place-based risk, things like racialized residential segregation, the kind of housing that people have access to, particularly as relevant to COVID. Um, so crowded housing, poor ventilation, communities that have fewer resources in which people can safely shelter in place, um, whether or not people are having to use public transportation to go out and get those resources, to have to go to work, whether or not people have to work and leave their home or whether or not they can work from home. All of these things um, contribute to whether or not there, there is a place-based risk that increases uh, their chances of contracting uh, the coronavirus and then subsequently um, having COVID-related morbidity and mortality. In addition, there is, and, and all of those things um, are related to structural inequities or structural racism. So there's that, then there's the individual risk. So things that we've um, already begun speaking about as far as the individual risk for chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, asthma, obesity, chronic kidney disease, cancer, and then the individual risk that comes with not just a medical disease, but uh, the individual risk from your social place um, in society. Um, so whether or not you're an essential worker, and there's been a lot of conversation about that. Um, then the individual risk that comes with the structural inequities, structural racism of being over-policed, more likely to be uh, put in jail. And that has been part of the, a large part of the national conversation of 2020. Um, things that we as healthcare providers um, have always, not always, but have um, primarily been discussing as we think about um, racial inequities, uh, disparities in healthcare access. Um, and so, these are uh, things that contribute to individual risks for uh, contracting uh, coronavirus. So what I'm now going to do is, now that we have sort of a better sense of how structural racism may put individuals and communities at increased risk for poor COVID outcomes, begin thinking about or talking about how we have um, it started from like uh, how we have 10 recommendations um, to begin to mitigate some of these, uh, these disparities. And so this is a paper that uh, I'm so excited that finally came out uh, last month, I believe, uh, that we actually wrote many months ago. Um, so a special shout out to Will Parker, who I know is on the line because he has been texting me. Um, sorry. Um, also, uh, to one of our medical students here, um, uh, to several of uh, my bioethicist friends, and to David Ansel and uh, Selwyn Rogers, who lead our city's uh, racial equity rapid response uh, to the COVID uh, res uh, to the COVID uh, disparities uh, sort of phenomena in 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 the city. And so, our work is a culmination of thinking about public health strategies and bioethical principles um, to address the COVID pandemic as related to racial disparities. And we draw upon some examples um, that the racial equity rapid response team has been putting into place. And so I'll go through 10 recommendations that we came up with. Um, and then at the end, sort of also 
highlight how this, how some of these um, recommendations that we've made have been, um, um, have examples from the task force. Okay, so first I would say, uh, we would recommend require the, the collection of race ethnicity data uh, with COVID-19 reporting. And that would make sense. However, uh, as of last year, um, 50% of patients have missing race and ethnicity data among the US states. We saw in that first map, some of the states had no data. Um, so we could, they were completely in gray. Um, and so obviously if we don't have data to collect, then we cannot track the disease. That is the disease across areas and also within areas. We cannot address what we don't know. And so we have to be able to have more information. Um, thankfully, what we do in Chicago every day is have a daily summary that is available to the public on a website. You just go to it and you can track by uh, demographics, by zip code, um, cases, testing, deaths, age, gender, race, ethnicity. And so this is something that our city has decided to put a significant amount of resources into, not just the human capital to keep these numbers up, but the financial capital um, in order to keep these systems running so that anyone can see at any given day um, where we are and the kind of progress that we're making and the progress that we need to be making. Because for a while we were doing really good. Now with the surges, we're you know with the rest of the country and not doing so well. Um, but we are at least able to know where we're going and so we can target our resources more effectively. Um, and this is something that has been uh, more controversial for cities and areas and states that have not been able to embrace that strategy. Um, second, I would say utilize race and place-based strategies to decrease COVID-19 exposure. And that would be my big theme for today, race and place-based strategies. So right, thank you. Um, some of, so so in, in, in light of this, I would say we would recommend uh, reciprocity for essential workers regarding PPE. So the very people who have been on the front line, um, we would say that they should at the very least all have access to PPE. Um, and this was um, much more relevant um, earlier in 2020 when there was such a shortage of PPE. Um, although I would say right now, um, to this day, many essential workers still do not have that kind of uh, guaranteed access. Um, we are thankful that essential workers have been highlighted um, as important as we begin our vaccine rollout, um, but uh, there's still some controversy in which essential workers um, are gonna be um, hi uh, highlighted for, for um, as part of you know, phase 1B. Um, partnerships with community-based organizations um, are gonna be essential um, as far as dissemination of resources, as far, um, as far as things like basic education, PPEs, hand sanitizer, fresh water. Um, there are many areas of our country that don't have running water. Um, and so you cannot wash your hands if you do not have water. Um, and so we have to think at the very basic level what communities need in order to be able to abide by our very basic public health recommendations to minimize um, the transmission of the COVID uh, virus, particularly in high-risk communities. Um, and as we think about these risk and place-based strategies, we have to particularly think about congregate living facilities and those include jails and prisons. And that has recently um, become more uh, controversial, um, has uh, taken more of a national spotlight as we began thinking about vaccinating um, older people in long-term care facilities and exactly how we're defining congregate living facilities. Because uh, for socio-political purposes, there are many people who do not value the human uh, lives that happen to be incarcerated. Um, but yet we know that from not only an ethical perspective, um, from a public health perspective, that the amount of COVID that is occurring within prisons is accounting for a significant burden of uh, uh, COVID that we're experiencing in our country, and that we know that uh, prisons are not closed systems. We also know that for people who are not in prisons, but are being over policed and cycled through our jail systems, that that is having a significant impact on the rest of the community. One of our recommendations is to release 
low risk, nonviolent offenders from prisons, which has been happening um, in some cities and states throughout the country. Um, and so we're recommending that more uniformly. And we're recommending that we are that we take active measures to decrease the jail cycling that has been happening um, in the country. Um, we have uh, evidence and that uh, from a paper that came out that was done here in Chicago, uh, lessons from Chicago's Cook County Jail. It was led by one of our uh, medical students um, who's also a public health uh, student at uh, Harvard and looked at the impact of over-policing and cycling people in and out of uh, Cook County Jail. And what they found was that approximately as of April, 2020, so still fairly early in the pandemic, but that people getting arrested, put in jail, being released back out into the community um, was, uh, was accounting for approximately 16% of the Chicago cases and accounted for about half, a little more than half of the variants around across Chicago zip codes in case rates. And that as a single variable that it exceeded race, poverty, public transportation use and population density as, uh, as a variable that accounted for this variance across Chicago zip codes. And so this is something that is a hugely important factor that we need to take account. Um, as we try to mitigate the impact of the COVID, uh, of COVID in our community, recognizing that we are, are only as a strong as a nation as the most vulnerable aspects of our community. We will only turn this tide if we are willing to embrace vaccinating those who are in the most vulnerable positions. And that includes people who are being over-policed, um, people who are being, you know, wrongly uh, convicted and putting in, in, in jail too often, and people that are also in prison. I'll just leave it at that. We can talk more about that in, in, in the discussion. Um, utilize risk and place-based strategies to increase COVID testing. So not just decrease exposure, but increase COVID testing. So there's a study that looked at um, testing rates and, uh, and as a result, there are some press in the New York Times uh, that said some areas of New York City are getting a lot more testing, guess which ones. Uh, so uh, and we can guess which ones, um, or I'll just tell you, the higher, <laughs> there were uh, areas that, higher, that had higher uh, percentages of uh, people that were white and had higher family incomes, despite the fact that we know that those same census tracts were much less likely to have rates of uh, case, case rates of positivity for uh, COVID. Um, and that we also know that for community uh, health centers, only 24% of them at the time uh, had, uh, were without drive-through or walk-up testing availability. And within the city of Chicago, testing site availability um, became available in predominantly white communities um, significantly sooner than it became available um, in non-white communities. So this is a map um, that, uh, or a graph that became available to me, um, thank to, thankfully, uh, because of Dr. Robert Vargas in our Department of Sociology. And it shows um, from April to May 15th, the disparities in access, physical access to COVID testing um, from April to May 15th again. So in uh, distance in miles from the closest, the first closest to the second closest uh, COVID testing site. And, and so you see that uh, for white populations, which are uh, ironically indicated in the solid black line at the bottom, uh, their uh, distance to the, to the closest, uh, first closest uh, COVID testing site was about two miles um, in comparison to approximately four miles for other racial groups. Um, and then if you look at the dotted red line, that is the second closest vaccine testing site for African-Americans. And that was about six miles away. So we look at a significant variation within Chicago when COVID was first sort of uh, um, playing out. Those disparities, thankfully, significantly decreased um, within a relatively short period of time. But we see that the communities that are hardest hit were the ones that were least resourced um, at the very beginning of the pandemic. And we can see that actually in um, these next two slides, which I am 
praying will work when I press the button. Okay, good, they will. These are also videos that were made available to me um, by Dr. Vargas. And so this is looking at Chicago testing sites by race with a sort of a motion in time video. And so this again is a map of our city. Um, areas in red this time are predominantly African-American neighborhoods. Areas in yellow are predominantly uh, Latinx neighborhoods. Areas in blue are predominantly uh, white neighborhoods. Um, and uh, areas in green have no majority. And so we'll see um, as little circles pop up, uh, those are areas that, that are COVID testing sites. And then on the top right-hand side, you'll see the date. And so as, as time progresses, you'll see um, how COVID testing sites became available to the city of Chicago. Okay. All right, so at the end of the day, uh, we, we noticed two things here. One, there is a significant disproportionate matching uh, between where the testing sites are um, and who needs the sites that, um, in general overall, and the rate at which those testing sites became available, right? And so there's two kinds of disparities happening. Um, one by um, sort of the pace, and one ultimately by place. And so those are things that contribute to why African-Americans are and Latinos are suffering disproportionately um, as part of the COVID pandemic. One contributor um, that is a reflection of what we call structural racism. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so this is stark, but it's not unique to Chicago. Uh, the same team did the same testing in Milwaukee. Milwaukee, the very same day that Chicago released its numbers about racial disparities, Milwaukee was another city had, that had the exact same story. Same maps um, um, down the line occurred uh, in Milwaukee, and there's another map that is almost exactly the same for St. Louis. And if they were able to map all the cities in the United States, my guess is that they would probably all look the same. Um, this is a, another similar map, but what it does is look at um, testing sites by federally qualified health centers. And federally qualified health centers are basically community health centers that have an additional status um, that allows them to get extra financial support by the federal government. And without sort of boring you with a lot of details, um, they, so they just become federally qualified community health centers. Um, <clears throat> so here again, we have a map of Chicago. Um, Majority African-American neighborhoods are in red. Latino neighborhoods this time are in pink. Uh, white neighborhoods are in blue and non-predominant neighborhoods are in white. Um, as uh, testing sites um, come onto the map, which again will be a, a video, they'll be uh, in yellow circles. Um, if they are an FQHC, a federally qualified health center, that yellow circle will have a black ring around it. And if it's a fellow qualified health center that does not have a testing site, that black ring will stay clear. And you see as we start the video, or as, uh, at least as we look right now, there are many of those circles that stay clear. Um, it's gonna sort of, uh, sort of reboot itself when we start the video. And so many of those will come off the page. Um, <clears throat> but right now, none of the FQHCs have testing sites. And then you'll see this change a little bit. All right. Okay, and so what this showed us is that many of the testing sites that came on board were not in community health centers 
whose primary purpose it is to serve the poor. Um, and the poor are disproportionately racial and ethnic minorities. So if we're trying to get to those communities that are historically marginalized, have fewer resources and have higher percentages of racial and ethnic minorities, we would go to the federally qualified health centers and make sure that they had sufficient supplies for testing. Um, but we, what we have seen in this map is that um, many of those FQHCs remained under resourced as testing sites. And as testing sites became, uh, came online, many of them were not at FQHCs. And again, many of them were in parts of the cities that, were, uh, that had lower rates of COVID um, and had, uh, if I superimposed a map of healthcare resources, were in areas that already had, that already had many other healthcare resources um, and weren't over-reliant on health, uh, federally qualified health centers for points of access for the community. All right. So what we need to do is have a, a greater investment of testing resources and infrastructure into areas with high case rates and test, test possibilities positivity. Um, and so that's part of what the task force has been trying to do, um, is to realign need uh, with resources. Um, and uh, so it has, it is a voluntary sort of uh, coalition of the willing with a number of academic medical centers. And I am thankful that the University of Chicago is one of them. Um, and a lot uh, small community health centers to, to large institutions who have banded together and said, we're going to try and do our very best to reduce these COVID disparities um, and to try and share resources um, and say, I have this, I'll give you this. Um, and how can we look at these hot spots in the city and, and lean in and provide extra resources to those areas that we know um, need more. And so that's one of the things that the, the task force has been trying to do. Um, one of the uh, things that I believe that we need to do more of and that we have not done yet as a city um, is to share patients. We have shared a number of kinds of resources, but uh, the, most, uh, the most vital resource that we can share is patients. And we have not done a, as good of a job as we can of sharing patients between health centers. Um, and I will get to that um, in, 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 another, uh, in another point. Uh, so number four would be repurposing ambulatory infrastructure for COVID-19 prevention, support, and monitoring. Um, and again, uh, that is something that we have all, uh, all participating organizations of the task force have been doing um, in, in lots of special and important ways. I lean here into Oak Street Health because they really took this on as part of their uh, core mission uh, when many of the uh, health centers had shut down and were working remotely. Um, and so with their decrease, with everyone's decreased patient, outpatient volume, they really took that as an opportunity to not only enhance their telehealth, but to really um, stand up their screening for social and medical needs um, around food insecurity, uh, medications, home monitoring for um, blood pressure, uh, diabetes, oxygen and temperature, um, and to really uh, lean into people's behavioral health needs also. So all of their front desk staff um, who were not checking in patients, um, the so, their, this army of social workers they had, and they uh, have patient transport vehicles that, they're, that were no longer then bringing patients to and from a clinic. They utilize this as, uh, as a new uh, sort of army of people and infrastructure to bring goods and services for people who are now sheltering at home with COVID or trying to keep them from having COVID um, in a way that really helps support chronic disease management for those at risk for COVID and help to help uh, and helped people uh, stay safe uh, who may have actually been um, suffering at home with COVID. So that was a, a great model and a great sort of shout out to Oak Street Health for doing this sort of flawlessly. Five, I would say uh, safely isolate and support COVID-19 patients from high uh, people who are living in high risk living conditions that they need to be safely isolated and supported. So who exactly does that mean? Um, so when people are diagnosed with mild COVID-19, um, but we ask them to shelter in place, 
um, people who are coming home from the hospital for moderate cases, um, but may still be within that window where they could be infectious. And then people who are quarantining um, and have, and they may possibly have a case of COVID, but we don't yet know. These are people who may be living in the crowded living conditions with poor ventilation, with multi-generational uh, um, housing that may have elderly people living in the home who are at increased risk for COVID. These are, are folks who could benefit from being safely isolated um, from the rest of uh, the community who may also be high risk. And so there's an increased risk of community uh, transmission um, in those circumstances. And so what we're talking about is, high, uh, is housing support for unsheltered persons, the ones we typically think about as being homeless, but also potentially expanding that definition to how we think about high risk sheltered persons, if we're really gonna try and have an impact um, because we already know that it's not just homeless persons that are um, at high risk for disease uh, risk and disease transmission. Uh, number six, uh, implement city and statewide protocols to share resources and patients. So this uh, is what I was re referring to earlier. Um, we know now that there is significant hospital variation in risk adjusted mortality, um, anywhere from you know, 7% to 81%. And so that is wide variation in how patients do in a hospital setting. And there are many factors that go uh, into determining uh, this hospital death rate. Um, and we know that for hospitals that have fewer ICU beds, that patients do worse. So hospitals who don't have the, the infrastructure, that don't have the you know, medical expertise, all the equipment, the, all the special things that um, some larger hospitals have that, are, that have you know, more beds, more practice, more whatever, that are just more accustomed to taking care of these patients. People who are in those larger hospitals do better and not because people in the smaller hospitals are not trying their best, they are fr frequently overwhelmed and may not be, you know, uh, particularly, um, that there may not be the expertise of that hospital. And so the odds of death um, are greater than three times um, for uh, hospitals that have fewer than 100 ICU beds. And so this is something that has been playing out across the country and something that has been plaguing our city, our beloved city of Chicago, um, where we know we do not have a coordinated system of uh, transfer for patients. So we can share resources, but we have not been transferring, we, we have not been sharing patients to the degree that we need to. And that is our most beloved resource. That is our, our, our most beloved um, uh, thing that we can share. Um, we have protocols for how we would share stroke patients, how we would share trauma patients, and we need a pandemic protocol in place. Um, and it is, you know, way beyond time for us to have had that, um, particularly now, uh, particularly now. This was the study that came out in JAMA that specifically was looking at factors associated with um, mortality for critically ill patients who um, are diagnosed with coronavirus and that called out um, various hospital factors such as ICU bed capacity. Um, seven, uh, allocate scarce resources specifically to reduce inequities. So one of the things that we know um, and that we're or at least some of us know, uh, so uh, <laughs> and I say that because I, we have some manuscripts that are in uh, under review um, that I have been working on with my colleagues that have been leading some of this work, uh, like uh, Dwight Miller and Bill Parker, um, that algorithms may exacerbate racial inequities. So for example, SOFA scores can overestimate African-American mortality. And so if we're using SOFA scores to determine who qualifies for scarce resources. Um, and we are now in that situation that we thought we would not be in where hospitals are, are beginning to have to make critical decisions about who is gonna get resources, um, where ambulances in, in California are being told patients who have no chance of surviving to the hospital don't even bring them to the hospital. Um, we're, we're going to have to pretty soon start activating some of these 
critical care protocols that are in place. And if they are ones that are biased against African-Americans, then they're ones that are gonna decrease the chances that African-Americans have access to some of these life-saving resources. Um, knowing that it will only serve to undermine the trust that the public has in providers, particularly marginalized uh, patients who have a deep well of well-earned mistrust in providers. And that trust is being tested right now as we are trying to encourage people to utilize the vaccine. And so we've seen um, the challenges that come with trying to rebuild that trust in a short time period. Um, as we are trying to push our way through you know, phase one, we haven't even finished the healthcare workers. And we already see that we are having challenges um, with issues of trust amongst our own hospital um, employees who have seen the ravages of COVID every day. And yet we still have employees uh, for many reasons that are still hesitant about the vaccine. And so we have to take very seriously at every stage um, how we are doing our, our daily business and how all of our protocols, all of our policies, all of our actions take equity into consideration um, if we really want to move forward with everybody on board um, so that we can make sure that everybody to the best of our ability um, has access to all resources um, and is wanting to engage as much as possible in these resources. Um, this is um, a paper that I co-wrote with, with one of my favorite bioethicists, Govind Prasad um, and uh, Zeke Emanuel about the FAIR, how, how we would see uh, or make recommendations around how to fairly prioritize or allocate uh, COVID vaccines. Um, and one of the things that we particularly put in there was prioritizing the disadvantaged, um, particularly addressing issues of socio socioeconomic disadvantage and oppression um, to make sure that we are thinking about some of the mechanisms in which racism ultimately impacts the health and well being of people of color um, and, and what that means for COVID and um, COVID outcomes disproportionately. And for the National Academy of Medicine, um, they have uh, added the mitigation of health inequities um, as one of their key ethical values um, and have included equity as a cross-cutting consideration in their recommendations of their phased framework as we move through uh, all the vaccine phases. Um, Right now, here's where we are with ACIP and their COVID recommendations as we're thinking about moving from 1A to 1B. Um, and uh, there was a revision of plans from in December uh, around age, moving from 65 to 75. Um, and I had made sort of a head nod earlier to essential workers and restricting them from all essential workers to frontline essential workers. Um, and, uh, but, <laughs> How this is playing out in the states is, you know, sort of a wild west, um, and I'm happy to sort of talk about that shortly. Um, let's see here. Last, this is sort of a blurry uh, box from the paper that I took, and I can't tell if it's blurry because I'm not wearing my glasses and can barely see, or because it's just really blurry. Um, this is. Uh, uh, just a summary of their racial equity rapid response from the city of Chicago and what the overall goals are, um, sort of the big picture vision of what we need to do to meet these goals um, and how the response has been organized into sort of four key categories, education, prevention, testing and treatment and support services and resources. Um, and what I'm going to do now, um, is just to give an example for each of these seven uh, recommendations that I've went through. I just give an example of, uh, or and I've tried to sort of pepper them throughout, but just to sort of, um, as we close and move into the Q&A, um, 
talk about um, a tangible thing that the task force is doing, has done, is recommended um, that, that, that lines up with these principles. So the first um, require the, the collection of race ethnicity data within uh, COVID-19 reporting. Um, I showed you that beautiful website that is kept up daily uh, regarding uh, COVID-19, the, the city's dashboard um, that have interactive maps and you can just do all of this wonderful, beautiful stuff. I'm not sure I've seen a city that does a better job of, um, of doing their COVID reporting. Uh, number two, utilize risk and place-based strategies to de decrease COVID-19 exposure. Um, so partner hospitals and health departments work with community-based organizations for distribution of PPE and food uh, and uh, conduct contact tracing. Uh, utilize risk and place-based strategies to increase COVID-19 testing. Uh, clients and staff in congregate settings. So for example, homeless shelters, nursing homes, senior buildings have been targeted in high risk black and brown neighborhoods via aggressive testing and contact tracing. Here in Chicago, 30 to 40% of our mortality has been found to be in those settings. And so those have been areas that have been um, highly targeted. Number four, repurpose ambulatory staff and infrastructure for COVID-19 prevention, support, and monitoring. I highlighted Oak Street Health um, because although I don't work there, I just happen to be a big fan of theirs. Um, but I also noted that um, everybody in the task force really leaned into that. Um, we had, uh, that was a key thing that we were prioritizing or systemic outreach um, as it's being conducted um, uh, to high-risk patients for prevention, social needs, and chronic disease management. Um, and I will say that every partner organization made this a priority to try and figure out how to identify, again, high-risk patients of all the patient, patients that were in the systems, um, and particularly those patients who may have been in one of those um, uh, four to six community areas those uh, within Chicago that we knew were having uh, the higher rates of COVID deaths, how can we reach those patients um, for in-home monitoring, medicine delivery, other social care needs, et cetera. Um, and you know, again, starting with those from those highest risk zip codes. Uh, number five, use multi-sector collaboration to facilitate safe isolation and support of COVID-19 patients from high-risk living conditions. Um, and so the city has, I've been talking a lot sort of just about the medical aspect, but that was just one arm of this task force. There are, there are multiple arms in play. And so the city has established partnerships with many other organizations. Um, another major player in that was the Greater Chicago Food Depository, which I have the honor uh, to be a board member of. Um, and in Chicago alone, the baseline rate of food insecurity has gone from about 4% to 18% during the pandemic. So a huge jump. Um, and so the city's response to that has been amazing. Um, and we've done, I say we, like, you know, the city has done things like repurpose city workers who uh, may have previously been a librarian or working in the DMV, but while many of these city operations were closed, um, had them working on food preparation um, in um, Malcolm X, so one of the city colleges, so that people could call 311 if they needed food and partnered with the Chicago Food Depository. And then they had streets and sanitation workers deliver food to people who needed it. So this really coordinated, beautiful effort on the part of the city with, in partnership with many other organizations to try and make sure that we were addressing issues of hunger and other needs that our residents had um, while we were trying to keep people safely sheltered in place. Um, number six, implement city and statewide plans to share resources and patients across hospitals, uh, hospital systems. So regionalization of the treatment of the sickest COVID-19 patients is being accomplished by transfer policies that allow safety net hospitals to transfer their sickest patients to higher resource hospitals, often academic medical centers. So I will say that some hospitals have really kind of leaned into this, um, but this is on a voluntary basis. 
I think what we need, or what I know what we need is a, a policy that is in place to make this mandatory. So it is a system um, that is not something that relies on volunteerism. Um, seven, allocate scarce resource medical uh, scarce medical resources to, to reduce racial inequities. Um, and so when remdesivir first became available, um, the city was allocating that um, in a way that was um, keeping inequities in mind. Um, and even as the city was first allocating vaccines, the very first hospital uh, that got their first shipment was Loretta Hospital. So a hospital that's based in a low income African, African American community. They're the ones who first got the, the COVID vaccine. Um, and so I think that the city has been thoughtful in how they are trying to address uh, racial and ethnic disparities um, in Chicago. Um, and with that, I will end and thank you all for your patience. I always say I have some sort of like horrible, you know, technological voodoo that just surrounds me and is always tripping me up everywhere I go. So uh, thank you for your patience. Um, <laughs> and I'll open it up to Q&A. Yeah. With that, again, uh, thank you, Monica, for sort of opening our, our theme of health disparities within the pandemic. Um, for the sake of time, yeah, let's just jump into a few questions that uh, your the opening of your talk um, prompted. Uh, one is, are all these physiological changes uh, personal or are they being transmitted genetically? That's a good question. Um, so it, it's both. Um, we uh, know that some of these impact people's lives right now, which contributes to um, the current burden of chronic disease. And we also know that some of these uh, epigenetic changes are passed on to people's children. Um, and that some of these changes may last for generations. And so it's both. Sure. And this is sort of in a similar vein. Do the biological changes show up in kids as well? So I think maybe not just genetically, but at, at the time that they experience this stress, or are they not apparent until adulthood? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I am not an expert in that. Um, my guess would say, my guess would be a, probably a little bit of both. Um, but I, I'm not a pediatrician and not that I don't care about kids. Um, but <laughs> I just, I just don't know enough about uh, children's uh, uh, and uh, disparities to speak uh, definitively on that. <laughs> okay. Um, would you mind telling us more about what you or they mean by sort of quote unquote life stresses? Is it just sort of mental stress? Um. Yeah, um, so uh, this is fascinating. So I would say that it is, it is both. Um, on one hand, it is, uh, it is really like mentally stressful, right? Um, but it is how that stress is internalized. So what, what um, people use uh, the chronic everyday uh, discrimination stress as is like a, uh, like a, P, a PTSD uh, uh, a model, like a, like a chronic stressor model. Um, and what we know is that it is the everyday stress of racism um, that sort of slowly grinds you down um, more so than it is the major events of racism because those are fewer and farther between. I've never seen um, somebody get you know lynched, although people in my family have been lynched, but those were generations past. Um, I've never seen anyone, you know, like any of these horrible things that have happened are only hearsay to me, right? But I have certainly personally had all kind of racist incidents, too many to name, even at the hands 
I mean, you name the situation in a bank, in the you know, healthcare system, at uh, the dry cleaners, at the, you know, Macy's, every place I have been in the educational system with my children, my son's baseball coach, the list is endless. Um, and one day I had so many, I was like, I might have a stroke, you know, <laughs> because like I had had five events in a day and I was getting on the plane and the, the, the stewardess asked me to leave because there are two people with a ticket and she assumes that I'm the one who's got the wrong seat and she, I should get out my seat. Like, why do you assume that I'm, and I was like, I think I might have a hypertensive stroke, you know? <laughs> so it's like these, I'm getting off, to, but it, <laughs> so it is, it is the chronic effect of these stressors that then in turn trigger uh, these autonomic responses. It's the cortisol. It's, you know, you know, the, it's their fight or fl flight response. Like all of these are fine if we're getting, I always say chased by the lion in the Serengeti, but black people are not getting chased by lions in the Serengeti every day, but it feels like it, you know? And so that is not normal. And so this, being a black person in America should not feel the way that it does. I just started reading a book, um, which has been out for a while now, um, called What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Blacker. <laughs> and I just started, and it's hilarious, but only because it's so true. And it's like, you know, white people have to do all of these things to feel the thrill of near-death experiences, you know, all of these extreme sports. All black people have to do is walk around in our black skin. And that is enough to feel the thrill of death because any minute we may get shot in the back by the police. We may get, you know, who knows what excitement, you know, lies ahead when we open our door and walk out, you know, trying to just go, go to work and come back home. And so like, that is not a normal way to live, but that is how we are living every day, you know? And so that kind of chronic stress affects our health. Certainly. Um, gonna jump to a, a few more, uh, oh, the questions are starting to pile up. I know we're sh sort of short on time. Um, uh, Will Parker notes that the current vaccine distribution map is the mirror image of the COVID mortality map. Basically zero vaccination to date in most vulnerable communities. What specific strategies should the city use to prevent disparities in vaccine allocation going forward. Say that again. Uh, so, I know so, Will has already told me this and probably shared this with. Yeah, no, so, so basically he's saying that, that vaccine distribution is sort of a mirror image of these other maps in terms of mortality. And so what specific strategies should the city use to prevent disparities in vaccine allocation as the rollout happens. Yeah, so um, Will and I actually have, uh, thank you Will for the shout out, uh, a paper with Govind, our um, other partner in crime, uh, under review now um, that advocates using um, a strategy that does not, um, that the trust take this into account. So right now, what has happened is that we are allocating vaccine on a per capita basis. Um, and so that we're saying basically that, and I was just talking to the fellows about this earlier this morning, that you know, uh, using the term fair as in to everyone an equal share. Um, but that assumes that everyone has an equal playing field, right? That everyone has an equal chance of getting COVID, which I've just made the argument that that is not at all the case. Um, and that that was, you know, that everyone, that the rates of COVID are equal throughout the country. And that is also not the case. When we see disparities um, in COVID case positivity and COVID death and COVID hospitalizations, when there's that kind of variation throughout a state, then we need to mirror um, what we're doing as far as resource allocation uh, to meet that. And so rather than saying, you know, everybody, you know, get one, we need to sort of cluster our resources 
for those areas that are hardest hit. Not just because it's the most fair thing to do, but it's because we're also going to, um, that's going to be our best way to mitigate, to mitigate the pandemic for everyone, right? Do you, you see, I mean, it, I just, I cannot, it is, it is unbelievable to me that we are not able to distribute our resources in a way that most effectively mitigates this pandemic. And the only reason that we have not been able to do so is because we, as a country, continue to not be able to reckon with our structural racism. Because, because we cannot imagine giving more resources to those in need when those in need are black and brown, you know? We insist on giving white people more even when they need it less. And that is going to be the Achilles heel that if we have not gotten low enough, will continue to drag us down. We are one in five in the globe for cases of COVID. Who would have ever thought that that would be the case? That this country would be behind almost every other country in, in the rates of COVID. But it's because we refuse to do the right thing and care for each other, socially distance, um, and allocate our resources appropriately. And so, I'll just. <laughs> that, that, that said, are, are you hopeful that the, the disparities that the harsh light of the pandemic has sort of highlighted that we all knew were there, but that I think have sort of bubbled up certainly more because of the pandemic. Are you hopeful that this will lead to meaningful change? That these discussions that are happening at higher levels will lead to appropriate resource allocation, policy change, political changes um, that will lead to meaningful closing of the gap of these disparities? You know, um, I have to be hopeful only because it is the only way I can get out of bed in the morning. Um, it is, it is, <laughs> I just have to have hope. Um, we could leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all need to have hope. Um, we'll try to get to a few more questions because I know the fellows have, have a class at 1.30, but how much of the disparities discussed, that you discussed, are caused by one ongoing or present acts of racism versus two economic and other inequities that may be the consequence of past racism? Mm. You know, it is, uh, that, that's a good question. And what I would say is that the impacts of our history are felt today. And so it's not, uh, it, so it's, it's hard to, to disentangle those, right? Um, we, the Nancy Krieger just released within the past couple of weeks, and I should have put, put some slides in there, um, maps of residential redlining that happened at the time that redlining was taking place and how they correspond to current maps of what we're calling the SVI, the Social Vulnerability Index. Um, and the SVI is what the CDC is recommending that we use to take into consideration as we think about um, COVID vaccine allocation for equity. So SVI is, um, it's a, it's a measure that has 25 variables that go into four different themes for a community around race, ethnicity, income, housing, uh, and transportation. So basically how vulnerable is a community to external threats? Um, and the maps are like this. And so basically what we did um, after World War II to restrict the ability for black people to get housing has directly impacted what we see today around the place-based risks that black people have and brown people have 
um, for getting COVID. And so, you know, the past lives with us every minute of every day. So it's not just that my current job is as an essential worker, you know, where I currently live is directly tied to, you know, policies from the past. Those, you know, we cannot, I mean, the people last week were waving the Confederate flag from the 1800s. How more can you say that our past is not present? You know, we are living that past every day. What, the next question that, I, that I'll ask sort of, I think gets this sort of thinking a bit about how the past influences how people think about the present. Um, what's the difference in vaccination rates between black and white medical center employees? And, and how do you feel about that? I don't know if you have those rates, but we certainly know that within the black community, um, there, there's a higher degrees of sort of hesitancy. Um, how do you feel about that? <laughs> That's hilarious. I feel great. Um, it's horrifying. <laughs> what do you mean? How do I feel about that? Um, so there is a lower um, acceptance rate. Um, what we know is that hospital employees fall along class lines. And so if you say black hospital employees versus white hospital employees, what you're saying is EVS workers versus doctors for the most part, right? Um, because there are very few black physicians. The black physicians are taking the vaccine just like the white physicians. It is the um, EVS th that right now are 18% uptake within our hospital. Um, and so, um, that's hard. That's horrifying. I have, you know, I've made it my second job to go around and do town halls and talk to the food depository and talk to my neighbors. I find out people in my social network are hesitant and I call them on the phone. They're like, hey, Mike. I'm like, hey, I heard you weren't going to, you know, and so um, it is everyone's responsibility. I take that very personally as my personal responsibility, but it's everyone's responsibility to try and make sure that we are moving forward together. Um, and that as we rush forward to move into phase 1B, that we don't continue to leave out whole groups of people that look like me. Because at the end of the day, if everyone standing who has not been vaccinated is black or brown, what is that gonna mean for disparities next year when people are celebrating in the streets because you know you know we've reached herd immunity but who hasn't been vaccinated are these other communities that have now been forgotten once the businesses reopen and clusters of vax of a uh, covid are still circulating and people are still coming in with covid but now nobody cares you know we've forgotten about it um, that is my concern and so now is the time for everybody to get behind this vaccine. Um, and um, yeah, so I feel horrible. Um, and I feel highly motivated to um, right this injustice. And, it's, and it's, 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 it's an injustice that is everyone's fault, not just you know the problem of the vaccine hesitant because it is a reasonable response to an unreasonable circumstance. And that is living life as a black person. And, and a question just popped up again, and this will probably be the last question uh, before I turn it over to Mark is, is that, you know, how should we empower sort of those physicians and leaders from diverse backgrounds to champion the vaccine, right? So what do you think this sort of institution's responsibility is to empower individuals like you to have an ample, have a larger and amplify your voice? You know, um, I would say, I have not been given any shortage of opportunity to speak. Mm -hmm. What I would say is that there needs to be structural support for that. You know, I am a clinical investigator, so I have more free time. I mean, no one has free time, but like, I'm not in clinic all the time. 
Um, but as our demand increases for more voices from people who look like me, we cannot continue to stack requests on top of persons of color who are already like going through our own emotional trauma, like, ooh, do I need to pack and leave the country? All these people trying to like take over the capital. Should I, you know, should I leave now? You know, like these are the questions that we're like struggling with as we then come to work and try and like take care of patients and like try and get people vaccinated. Like we are traumatized. And so if we're going to be leaning more into physicians of color to, we need to also be, be you know, setting, si setting time aside, we need to think about structural racism in a way that has structural policy solutions and not just say, hey, black people, can you volunteer again? You know, <laughs> no, we, I can do this if we have the same kind of support that other things that are valued by the institution are given. You know, that's what we need. Are you hopeful about that? <laughs> <laughs> Mark, Mark, I'll turn it over to you to, to, to finish things up. I know we're sort of uh, getting towards the end and I apologize um, to not for not getting to all the questions and we apologize for the initial technical difficulties. But Mark, I'll turn it over to you for the final word. Well, the, the final word is to thank Monica for an extraordinary talk. Um, it was extremely illuminating and, and de deeply moving. Um, um, I, I did want to say very briefly that one of the persons you mentioned, Govin Prasad, who you said such nice things about, will be speaking in this series on March 3rd. And I think his focus will be on the allocation of the, of the vaccines, um, at least at the moment, that, that's, that's my thought. Um, will Parker will also speak um, in the spring the spring quarter on things. I, I have one minute to, to ask you one very brief question. Um, you, you had said that there was a decrease in, um, in the number of incarcerations for people who were at low risk and nonviolent offenders. And I wanted to just ask if you knew if that was just with regard to the local city and state jails, or if it included in Chicago, the federal jails also? Um, no, I did not mean to say that. Uh, what I meant is that we should decrease that population by releasing people who are low risk offenders. So um, people who are, there are so many people that are in our prison system that should not be there. Um, who you know are there on technical glitches um, or who are no longer a risk. Um, and so when um, other cities have gone through and just combed that list and said, who needs to be here and who doesn't because they're, they, you know, some people could be released but ha need to have a place to go, but they don't have family to go to. So they stay in jail, you know, well, maybe we could uh, provide housing so that they could, you know, go to this place and not get COVID and die. They could be released, you know. And so um, when people have started doing that, they're able to decrease the prison population, which decreases the overcrowding. Um, and so decreases the chances of spread, um, just all kind of stuff. And so that's what I meant, is that we should try and decrease that population. Thank you so much. And th thank you for the, this brilliant talk. It was <laughs> wonderful and moving. And it opens up the, um, the series of talks that we hope to have over the next uh, two and a half months on, on disparities in, in healthcare relating to COVID-19. So, Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks for, uh, from all of us. <laughs> Bye, Gail. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.